I was a freshman at Princeton, and I didn't really have any intention of starting a social business. But I dropped out of school eight years ago because I just fell in love with the concept of garbage. Our major global solution for garbage, put it in a pile or burn it. These are not sophisticated solutions. And that's how TerraCycle came to be, to help eliminate the idea of waste by making things that are non-recyclable, recyclable. Can a plastic bag technically be recycled? 100%. Can a candy wrapper? 100%. And we do it. We're the biggest collector and processor of wrappers, chip bags, and other flexible packaging in the world. But you need a unique system because on its own, the economics don't work. Our collectors are the most vital aspect of our business. We have close to 26 million people sending us this waste. And that whole cost is funded by major consumer product companies because they found that the public was craving a solution to their waste. There's a potential new What is that? Fire hose. We were thinking of accessories. Fire hose pothole. Our team of scientists and our team of designers look at every type of waste stream and identify what are the solutions for each one, because really each type of garbage has a different heartbeat. Juice pouches become backpacks. Chip bags can melt into an injection moldable plastic. And with dirty diapers, the super absorbent polymer ends up being used in the farming industry, so the soil has better water retention. And the plastic is made into something like a park bench. We have evaluated every consumer waste stream, and every type of garbage has a solution. Now, of course, if we stopped buying stuff, none of these problems would exist. We are on a consumption fix. Our grandparents, they had way less stuff. When you bought a table, you would buy it with an intention of having it passed down to your kids and their kids and so on. Then we went out of a Great Depression. We went into the biggest global war we have ever seen, and we wanted to rebound from that. The idea of consumption and the idea of disposable products solved the failure in the economy. I don't think TerraCycle would have succeeded 20 years ago or 30 years ago, but we're tapping into this desire that is so deep amongst everyone to do the right environmental thing. We're collecting millions of pieces of waste every day. And so while people are addicted to consumption, and so am I, we are willing to try to solve it. Every single object in this office is garbage. And it really is there to inspire people to feel like they can come up with anything and run with it. Maybe it won't work, maybe it will. Only uh, putting it out there will allow us to know. Thank you. So obviously, I want to talk to you about garbage today. And uh, just to tell you a little bit about where this all started, um, this concept came up to me about nine years ago. I was a freshman at college, and like most freshmen, I was enjoying um, growing certain plants, like these baby ones we were sort of experimenting with. But if you've ever done this, as you can see, it's inside, it's hydroponic, you have to make sure no one can smell it. It's a whole process. <laughs> And uh, my friends and I uh, were having a lot of trouble making the plants work. The other problem is we're a bunch of guys. What do we know about gardening? And uh, one day, after about a year of experimenting, this was in the middle of my freshman year, we, uh, I got a call from my friend because he was uh, doing all the growing in Canada. It's a little bit easier there than down here. And uh, he said, well, look, I have solved the plants. You've got to come up, get in your car, drive up. So I, I go up to Montreal, and I walk into a garden, not like this, but full, blooming, beautiful, highly inspiring. And I asked him, you know, how did you do that? And he said, garbage. And I go, okay, well, I do explain, because that's not really making sense to me. Sounds really good. And he said he started taking organic waste, uh, basically stuff that looks like this, and feeding it to worms. And then the worms would eat the organic waste and poop out worm poop, and that was the fertilizer he was uh, feeding his plants. So this is organic waste, and this is uh, basically how it all began. And I started thinking, you know, this is really cool. There's a lot of opportunity in the idea of garbage, because garbage, by definition, is something we pay to get rid of. It's actually one of the ways to define the whole concept or the material of waste, because it wouldn't be garbage unless we're willing to pay to get rid of it. So, um, you know, we were thinking, well, how do we convert lots and lots of organic waste to lots and lots of worm poop? My friend and I came up with this idea, which is basically based on a toilet. I know it's hard to tell, well, how is this a toilet? But, well, you know, let's deconstruct what a toilet is. And a toilet, to me, is really just a chair whose purpose is to move our poop away from us as fast as possible. <laughs> I don't know any other purpose of the toilet, just to get rid of our stuff. 
And if you think about it, what it really boils down to is we don't like hanging out near our own poop. I don't think any animal likes doing that. We try to go as far away from it as possible, hence inventing the toilet. And this is based on basically the same idea. We would take the organic waste I showed you before, warm it up through composting, then put it down into the middle. And these are conveyor belts that would move away from the center, bringing this cooked food away from the center of the device. And so we put worms on it. And the idea was that the worms would move away from their poop, which they do, into the new food at a slow rate. And it turns out at about an inch every hour is what they would do. So we just turned the conveyor belts in the opposite direction at an inch every hour. And it, the thing worked. I couldn't believe it when, when we actually got it going. But this basically would keep dropping off worm poop. And that was really exciting. Um, I ended up at this point dropping out of school to sort of dedicate my time to this project. And the challenge was that no one would finance us. And uh, you know, every time we've come up with a challenge, we came back to this question of what is really garbage. And I want to just pause on this because I would say garbage is a very, very modern idea. First, it doesn't exist in any capacity in nature. If you were able to ask a tree, you know, what is, uh, or, or a plant, what is waste, it couldn't define it. The definition of waste doesn't exist in nature in any way. And I think it's one of the most basic things we learn in sort of elementary school ecology or geography or whichever topic we learn about the food chains. The biggest output for any system is the most important input for the next system. Where this breaks down is the human uh, uh, system. But I would argue that it only breaks down because of two things. One is consumption. We buy way, way more than we need. You know, let's say my shirt rips uh, later today for some reason. I'm not going to fix it. There's not even a place I can take it to fix it anymore. I'm going to go to a store, buy a new one, and throw it out. And then the other problem is that that would be OK if we made things from materials nature knew what to do with. But when you add the fact that everything now is made from complex materials, most of what we're touching right now, every object in the world one day will become waste, but almost everything we're touching, it's made from complex materials. And these things nature doesn't know what to do with. If you look at the overall problem, it's 5 billion tons a year, 25% of that ending up in our oceans. So it's a very, very big issue. So as we were building our business, we started thinking about, well, where are there solutions in garbage? And the first thing is every object in the world, by definition, ends up as waste. The only question is, does it happen quickly? Like as soon as you know, someone's finished drinking this bottle of water, this bottle will become garbage? Or will it take a while, like um, you know, a phone that'll last until the new version of the phone comes out and then mysteriously it breaks? If you look at it, some systems, some things like soda bottles, aluminum, and so on can be recycled. But the question is really, why is something recyclable? The answer is not anything to do with the technical capacity, it's economics. The value of aluminum, for example, is higher than the cost of collecting aluminum cans and processing aluminum cans. And that is why people are in the business of recycling aluminum. But everything else, about 80% of consumer products, even though they all can technically be recycled, can't, don't, because they end up in, uh, there's no economics on them, they end up in the waste stream, and then there's only two things that happen once it goes in the garbage. Either it goes into a big pile, called a landfill, or it is burned for energy. It basically turns into carbon and a little bit of energy. So it's a big challenge. Um, and uh, as we were thinking about you know, how to start packaging all this worm poop, we thought about could we find the answer in garbage? So we went around to all the recycling containers in the area. We sorted out all the used soda bottles. I ended up and spending a night in jail learning that you can't go through people's garbage. It's not actually legal to do that. <laughs> so I had a chance to reflect on this um, uh, overnight. <laughs> but we found something really, really interesting in the world of garbage. Take soda bottles, hugely prevalent waste stream. What's amazing about soda bottles or any type of bottle containing a liquid is in most markets, there's only a few volumes. In the world of soda bottles, there's only half liter, 20 ounce, which is this bottle, one liter and two liter. Bottles like this, this is a quarter liter, hardly exist. So for all intents and purposes, there's four volumes. It's even more standardized because stores like standardization. The only difference between a Coke and a Pepsi bottle is the contour. The tread on the cap, which may seem trivial but is incredibly important, is the same on every bottle ever made, uh, and same with the base. The, and the height is the same. The only difference between these iconic bottles is the contour. So this became our first product. We took used soda bottles, we took off the label, filled it with liquid worm poop, even had leftover trigger heads, and then we used shrink wrap labels, which is the only part that isn't garbage, because every bottle was different. One was a Coke bottle, one was a Pepsi bottle, and so on. One thing we learned in the process of making products from garbage is the intellectual property rights of garbage. Pepsi still owns the shape of the bottle as waste. Even if we fill it with something else, they still own the shape. To the point where we had to end up getting licenses from Coca-Cola and Pepsi, which we now do to package shit in their distinctive shape and sell it. Um, <laughs> you can, uh, and you can buy that at Walmart if you wish. Now, 
what we started thinking about is could the theory that worked for worm poop in a soda bottle apply to more things? Were we just sort of a fertilizer idea, or could this concept be applied to every type of waste? So the way to design around the garbage problem is to think about first what is the object. And I would argue that any object, if you're going to think about it from the perspective of garbage, is made up of three things. Let's just take this bottle because I'm picking on it, uh, so I might as well use it as the example. I'm going to drink this water, now it's garbage. Now I could recycle it, um, but let's just look at it from a garbage object perspective. First, it's made from PET, which is a form of plastic. And that is the composition, what it's made from. And that's usually all we really think about. But it's not just a pile of PET granules in my hand, it's in the form of a shape which is expensive. It's a mold. It costs money to form it. So it's also what form is the composition in? What is the features of the product? And then there's one more aspect that took us a little time to figure out, which is, and also very important, is what was the intention of the, of the object? The intention of this is to hold a beverage. It's not to put a plant in it, which it could work at. It's not to flip it upside down and fill it with bird seed and make it a bird feeder. It's the intention is to hold a beverage. And if you think about garbage in these three ways, very quickly you can get to a pyramid of what you can do with garbage from a design perspective. The worst thing to do with garbage is to send it to a landfill because there you're attributing no value. And you'll notice this pyramid has everything to do with how much value you are attributing to the waste. And that directly proportionally equals its sustainability credentials. Now the next best thing with that bottle is to burn it for energy. There you're not valuing the shape, you're not valuing the intention, you're sort of valuing the composition but only from what they call a caloric value, the energy value that's inside that bottle. And the only problem with the first two is they're both singular solutions. You can only do them once. And when we think about objects and products, it's really important to know that the most destructive aspect of our consumption isn't the shipping it around, isn't really any aspect except extracting materials from the earth. If this t-shirt is cotton, I think it's not, I think it's like some other material, but say it was cotton, 90% of the carbon impact of making this t-shirt, even if it was made in China or wherever, is growing cotton, turning soil into a textile. And it's the same for everything else. If you have a gold ring on your finger, two tons of rock had to be extracted to get that gold out. That is the real key. So the point is valuing these materials. So from a cyclical perspective, there's three solutions we have seen. The base solution is recycling. Recycling, you melt the bottle and you value the plastic, but you don't value the shape or the intention. The next above that would be upcycling, where you value the shape, you value the, uh, uh, what it's made from, but you don't value the intention. You actually purposely put it into a different intention. And then the very best thing is to reuse it. Just fill it again with something else and you value all aspects. Now, there's a magical thing that's even better than anything on this chart. And it's the most fundamental thing, I think, if you left with any message from me today, it's the vote is in our hands. You know, people love pointing fingers at Kraft and Coca-Cola and saying, you guys are polluting our world with all this stuff, but we're the ones buying the products. If we stop buying the products, they won't make the products. So if we started demanding not disposable products, but more durable products, that, lo and behold, is what would be made. So we have to really take responsibility of this issue ourselves. So I just want to show you what this looks like. Reuse is really, really exciting because you value every aspect of the material. We've seen that it's available in three basic categories of garbage. One is high-end electronics. We collect hundreds of thousands of cell phones, ink cartridges, laptops, and so on. We're not the only ones to do that. And you can very easily refurbish them and then sell them again as what they were intended to be. Apparel, shoes, clothing, it already happens with Goodwill and others, but that's another great area where you can simply refurbish. The biggest issue with clothing is not that it wears out when it becomes garbage, it's fashion. Fashion is one of the biggest creators of waste because most people think about just on, on our own closets. We throw stuff out, not because our shirt is tethered, but because it's not fashionable anymore. The other area where reuse is really exciting to me is simple shaped rigid objects. So this was the worm poop line. That was the first product. And then we expanded it to everything from bird feeders to different types of things. And you can see the idea of reuse in the soda bottle world. But then we, real, uh, we were starting to work with uh, Kraft and Unilever and we found that margarine packages or butter packages, dairy packages, are the exact same specification as what you buy plants in when you go to a nursery and you buy a plant. It's that flimsy black pot, it's very thin, you throw it out after you've uh, bought the plant. Turns out it's the exact same spec in every way as a butter tub. So last year we took 35 million butter tubs, simply put a hole in the bottom, and this is how they were sold at, I believe, Walmart in California. Complete direct reuse. We're about to launch a program in our business in the UK where uh, we're gonna be collecting trigger heads with uh, Procter & Gamble. 
And trigger heads, you know, are the things you put on like a window cleaner or something. Um, they're not recyclable. So we're going to come in, we're going to evaluate which ones are clean, which ones are dirty. The dirty ones will go to recycling, where you only value the material, but the clean ones will just be cleaned again for safety's sake, and it'll be the world's first time that a major consumer product has directly reused trigger heads and so on. So that's reuse. Now the next area is upcycling. Upcycling is really fun, but I will warn you it's limited for the reasons you'll see. Upcycling is cool because you value two things, the material and the features. The only thing you don't value is the intention. Juice pouches make great backpacks, but they were never built to be backpacks. Ironic, they're actually better performance than any other material backpacks are made from. They outperform cotton on durability tests. This is pet food bags. These are toothbrushes. The range of solutions in upcycling is just limited by your creativity. We have so far developed and commercialized close to 2,000 unique products that are based on upcycling, and everything when I mean commercialized is done in very, very large scale. These are mail bags from the post office, these are granola wrappers for shower curtains, and the list goes on and on, whether it's speakers, whether it's stationary products, whether it's football or soccer balls, shoes, these are in Japan that we make with Timberland, the waist shoe, all the way to really fun things. It took a lot of work actually to get those raw materials together, but not, not complaining. <laughs> all the way to like couture dresses and everything. There is no limit. Even all of our offices now around the world have a rule where every aspect except the computers must be waste. This is our offices in uh, Germany. Um, everything you see here, everything is garbage. Or in Sao Paulo, everything is garbage. This is our headquarters in New Jersey. Everything except the computers, without exception, is pure waste. And there is no limit. It's just a creative question as long as you put things into a different context and value their features and the material it's made from. Then everything else can go into recycling, which is melting it and valuing the material that something is made from. Everything you see in this picture is recycling things that were never recycled before anywhere in the world. And what I can tell you that's really exciting for us is today we've evaluated every consumer waste stream. And we have found that without exception, every consumer facing waste stream can be either reused, upcycled, or recycled. To the point where this year we just launched national programs um, in Canada and, uh, for the world's first national collection program for cigarette butts. It's already tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands, our butts are coming in. They can easily be shredded, separated, and recycled. That cigarette program is actually launching this week with the two biggest American tobacco companies. Ironic, by the way, to work with big tobacco as a green uh, business. Um, <laughs> But trillions of butts end up on our street, and that's a big issue. In Brazil, in one month, we launched the world's first national program to collect and recycle used chewing gum. Turns out gum isn't food. It can be injection molded into plastic. Um, and the third, is another sort of big one for us, is uh, here in the States, uh, in about a month or two, we are launching the world's first national program to collect and recycle used dirty diapers. In every aspect, the answer always comes out by look at what is the material made from, what are the features, can they be leveraged, and what was the intention, and can the intention be leveraged? So, for example, these may seem like normal products, but they're 100% pet food bags. Or this may seem like a you know, typical Mr. Potato Head, except there's a difference. It's 100% potato chip bags. And what we found is, again, every type of waste can be either recycled, this would be recycling examples, or upcycled examples. The challenge is that these programs have gotten so big, for example, with just this waste stream juice pouches, half a million are coming in every day in the US alone, which means you can only make a certain number of backpacks. Only about 1% in this uh, waste stream goes into upcycling, while 99% goes into recycling. That fence, for example, uses 20,000 juice pouches, while the backpack uses up maybe 26 or 28 depending on the version. Here again, flexible packaging, recycling and upcycling. We even started now talking to a lot of our corporate partners and finding ways that they can integrate the waste back into their design process, which is the true cradle-to-cradle -cradle manufacturing cycle. This pen right there may seem exceptionally normal, World's first pen product made 90% from used pens, commercialized uh, here in the US and Canada. Uh, you'll see next year the world's first oral care product, a toothbrush, uh, that is gonna be made entirely from used toothbrushes by the biggest toothbrush company in the world. Or the world's first lipstick product made by L'Oreal that is gonna be entirely, oh, sorry, cosmetic product made entirely from used cosmetic packages. What we found is that the way to solve garbage takes really three key steps. First, you have to collect the waste. And one of the unique things that we've learned about garbage is the big issue of garbage is that it's all mixed together. Separated collection is the fundamental way to solve every single form of garbage. You're all, you know, we're all, a lot of design talent in the room, a lot of smart people in the room. I bet you if I said, look, I have a truckload of, or 10 trucks of vinyl records, 
Very easily, within minutes, we could come up with answers. The real problem is not that, it's how do you get pure waste streams? So the first question was really creating collection systems. Then the second question became developing solution systems. And we used to make all these products ourselves, and we realized that, look, we don't want people buying these things because they feel green or they want to like badge and you know, show that they're green, because that's limited. Wouldn't it be great if people were buying these things without even knowing that they were doing a good thing? So what we started doing is instead of designing and developing products, we got into the idea of just focusing on developing materials from the waste and working with existing companies to eliminate virgin materials they were using and start using garbage to make their product. So the way the collection system works, and what I'm really excited about is that this works the same today in 22 countries around the world, is you go to the website here, terracycle.com, choose any of 60 types of waste you want to collect. You take a box, fill it up with that garbage. We give you a free shipping label. We even give you two cents for every piece of garbage you send us to your favorite school or charity. And that way you can start collecting segregated waste streams. In the US already, I believe 28 million people are actively collecting through this system about a million pieces of waste per hour. Um, and then as we saw, you know, people started saying, well, could we replicate this in other markets? And, you know, do people care about garbage the same way in every market? The challenge is that, you know, not every country has the same level of resources as we do. And people's recycling systems are not a reflection of what their intentions are or whether they care or not about garbage. It's simply a reflection of uh, is there a system in that country to be able to handle these things? Um, so as we started launching the program, this was, for example, juice pouches, which began collection in, in August 2007. In the first year of that program, we collected maybe about 1,000 pouches a month. Today, half a million per day coming in. And then the same thing started happening all over the world. I pick Argentina as an interesting case study. We launched there about a year and a half ago because everyone said Argentina doesn't care about recycling. They say that because if you go to Argentina, say Buenos Aires or any of the other areas, there is no recycling. So it's an, in, it's an interesting inference, but it has actually, the lack of recycling has nothing to do with the people's caring. We launched a program there to collect juice pouches as well, and within a year, 1.5 million people in Argentina had joined the program, and today collecting between two and 300,000 juice pouches. What we found is that garbage is a global problem, and that people want to solve it. The issue is that there may not be the infrastructure available in those countries to help these systems be created. Recycling uh, is not cheap and it requires infrastructure to be able to do it. Here's the same sort of map in Europe already, I think 1.6 million people in Europe collecting waste, and all over the world today in 22 countries you can find the system. The key aspect is hopefully we all start looking at garbage differently. And the key perspective to look at it from is not our human perspective, but is nature's perspective. Nature's perspective is simply that there is no garbage. And if you begin with that truth, and it is a more fundamental truth than our truth because we only invented garbage 70 years ago, is that if you take the truth that there is no waste and you look at the three components of what makes up any object, its material, its, uh, its form, and its intention, you can, without exception, find ways to create cyclical processes. Instead of spending huge energy extracting things, using them for you know, a minute or two, and then having to do that whole process all over again. So that is how we are taking small steps in helping eliminate the idea of waste. Thank you.